Good evening. Hello. I'm so glad that you're here to watch this live stream about Joseph. We're going to be surveying the story of Joseph, specifically chapters 42 through 50. This is kind of the second half to the Joseph story. And so last week we saw his rise to second in command, only second to Pharaoh. And we're going to see how Joseph's dreams come true. The dreams where he talked about his, his family bowing down to him. If you're not familiar with the Joseph story, you're really in for a treat as we go through Genesis 42 through the end of the book, Genesis 50. And of course, if you are already familiar with uh, the book of, of uh, Genesis about Joseph, by all means, uh, this will be a great reminder to you. And I'm going to bring out some details that we don't talk about a whole lot. And what I want to encourage you to do is read the story of Joseph. I want you to read Genesis 37 through 45 in particular. And, uh, uh, and then if you would pick up chapter 50. I'd love for you to read 37 through 50, of course. Uh, so tonight, let's... Let's uh, talk about uh, Joseph in his fulfillment of his dreams when he sees his brothers. If you're just tuning in after the fact, uh, this live stream is, is over. Thanks for watching. I appreciate so much you uh, picking this up. For those who are live, I want to encourage you to submit some questions or comments uh, via Facebook or YouTube. If you want to give a shout out and say, I'm here, that would be wonderful as well. Uh, appreciate all of you who have, who have chimed in tonight, and I hope this live stream will be helpful and encouraging. I will remind you that the big picture book is what we're following, uh, and uh, if you don't have a copy of this book, that is fine. You, you need the book called the Bible, and the big picture is, is a basic guide uh, to help people who are new to the Bible. And right now I'm running a, a sale. The book right now retails for $24. And I'm offering the book on my website, Holy Bible Study. That's W-H-O-L-L-Y Bible Study uh, through the end of this month. And I'd love for you to pick up a, a copy of the book. That's for one copy. And uh, you can go to holybiblestudy.com, pick up a copy of this book 
using the coupon code live winter live winter again that expires um, on the 31st of this month uh, let me tell you a little bit about the church where i preach uh, i preach for the parkway church of christ here in corpus christi texas and we strive to go by the Bible and it only. We just want to be New Testament Christians. We're looking forward this Sunday to having a special guest, Phil Robertson. So uh, you, you'd really be in luck. You, you won't have to hear me preach. <laughs> looking forward to Phil Robertson coming, working with our young people Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. Of course, we've been announcing that uh, here in, in Corpus. And um, I, I'm... Uh, excited to have Phil come back and be with us and work with our young people. Well, let's get to the business at hand. I want us to think about this exciting story of Joseph uh, as we pick it up in chapter 42. And what we see is Joseph is now a, a an Egyptian. At least that's what he looks like. He looks like an Egyptian. He talks like an Egyptian. Uh, he's been in Egypt for over 20 years by this time, and he is incognito. <laughs> uh, when his brothers are going to arrive, he will recognize them. I I'm going to start in Genesis 42, and what we see is that Jacob and his family in Canaan are suffering because of the famine. There were seven years of plenty, as we looked at last week, followed by seven years of famine. They are two years into the famine. And it says, uh, 10 of Joseph's brothers went down to buy grain in Egypt. That's verse three. Uh, it says in verse four that Jacob did not send Benjamin, Jake, uh, Joseph's brother. And so he, he's got these 10 half brothers, but Benjamin and, and Joseph are both the sons of Rachel. And so they're full brothers. And uh, it says that, that Jacob does not want to send Benjamin, the youngest, because he's afraid something might happen to him, just like something had happened to Joseph, his, his brother. Uh, what he doesn't know, of course, is that Joseph is still alive. Verse 6. Now Joseph was governor over the land. He was the one who sold to all the people of the land. And Joseph's brothers came and bowed themselves down, um, bowed themselves before him with their faces to the ground. All right. So what we see next as they're bowing down to Joseph is that Joseph sees his brothers and recognizes them. They don't recognize Joseph. Like I said, he, he looks different. He doesn't look like a Hebrew uh, sheep herder. He, uh, he looks like an Egyptian, and an, an Egyptian in the position of great power. He's the one who decides who can have the grain and who can't. And so he starts talking to them. And what you're going to find out later is he's talking to them through a translator, even though he could have just talked to them in their native language of Hebrew. Uh, where do you come from? He said, and again, this is this is through a translator. We'll find that detail out later. Uh, we're here to buy uh, food. We're, we're from the land of Canaan. And it says again, Joseph recognized his brothers, but they did not recognize him. This is really important. This is uh, a lot of fun. Uh, and you, I'm sure you've watched sitcoms or TV shows or even movies where we know who the character is, but the people he's interacting with, he or she is interacting with, don't. And, and it allows us to, to kind of see both sides where, where Joseph knows and understands every word that his brothers are, are saying amongst themselves. In fact, uh, we see this in, in Genesis 42, where the brothers have just talked about how badly they treated Joseph. And, and that's why uh, they're, they're suffering here at the hands of this mean Egyptian. And um, they don't know it's Joseph <laughs> the whole time. It's delightful. Uh, they did not know that Joseph understood them, for there was an interpreter between them. 
Uh, what we're going to do tonight is look at a lot of details uh, surveying the Joseph story. And I'm, I'm encouraging you to read the story with this information. Uh, and, and I'm kind of giving you the cliff notes, give you a, a bird's eye view so that you can read the text and delight in the details yourself as you read. Uh, I'm going to tell you something else about Joseph. He, he disguises who he is, what he is, by making statements like this. He says, do you not know that a man like me can indeed practice divination? I, I will tell you, I do not believe Joseph practiced divination. He is playing up to being an Egyptian. He is not uh, someone who worships other gods. I mean, the Egyptians worshiped everything. They worship crocodiles. They worship the 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 river, the uh, the Nile River. They they worshiped everything. Well, Joseph d doesn't. Uh, I do not believe that he he was um, ever anything but a true Hebrew who worshiped the Lord God. Uh, all right. So going back to Genesis forty two. So we we've read basically the first eight verses, here's verse nine. Joseph remembered the dreams that he had dreamed of them. And he said to them, you are spies. You have come to see the nakedness of the land. Well, why is Joseph doing this? He's testing his brothers. He wants to see if they've changed. We're never told that specifically, but but Joseph doesn't um, want to hurt his brothers. Uh, do you remember what we looked at last week in the very first chapter when, when Joseph's brothers uh, see Joseph coming? He's, he's coming to oversee, to be the foreman and, and, and report to dad, uh, to dad about them, tattle on them. They're in Dothan. They're not where they're supposed to be. And the brothers see him. And they say, let us kill him. Then we will see what will become of his dreams. Well, there's some irony there because we know now what became of Joseph's dreams. They were fulfilled when the brothers bowed down to Joseph. Didn't know it was Joseph. And yet the dreams have been fulfilled. The dreams that Joseph had in Genesis 37 that begin the Joseph story. I want to walk through 10 delightful details. I love the Joseph story because of all these intricacies, all these details that help us delight in this delicious story. It is so exciting. What do we see? Joseph is intentionally harsh. He does not intend harm to his brothers. He's testing them. But he is harsh, He's telling, telling them, you are spies. I know it. I just know it. And, of course, they're not. He's trying to get information out of the brothers, and he, and he does just exactly that. He finds out that Benjamin is alive, that, that dad is alive. But in verse 30, he says uh, that the, uh, the brothers are, are re recounting to Jacob when they go back home, and they say, well, this man, the, the Lord of the land, Talking about Joseph. He spoke roughly to us and took us to be spies of the land. We assured him, though, we, we are honest men. Uh, it's open to interpretation, isn't it? Uh, Joseph, in his communications with him, I believe, is, is covering up his relationship with the one true God by saying, I fear God. He's still being the harsh Egyptian there in Genesis 40, uh, 42. And he threatens them with death unless they go back home and bring Benjamin that, that Jacob wouldn't allow to, to come. Uh, so the brothers do go back and report to dad. And he says, why did you tell him so much of this? Why did you tell him so much about our lives? And he says, well, he kept asking these pointed questions. So you see, you see Joseph, uh, who knows them, being able to take advantage of that to our utter enjoyment. Uh, and, and, and I've mentioned this already. Uh, Joseph works on them through a translator, but he understands every word they're saying. He understands when they're not 
wanting the translator to translate, and they're talking amongst themselves about what they did to Joseph over 20 years before. So we get to see all that. And, and that's what's going on in chapter 42. Um, when, when the brothers go to Egypt, uh, Joseph pushes their buttons, and, and then he, uh, he goes back to... Um, he, he goes back uh, to, uh, to <clears throat> they go back to Egypt. They go back to Canaan. I'm distracted. I, I've got a comment here. Sorry about that. Here's my father giving a shout out. Thank you very much. I appreciate that. Glad you're glad you're tuning in. Uh, so so Joseph sends them back to Egypt, except for Simeon. So let me let me bring that up now. This is my fifth delightful detail. Uh, Joseph lets, lets them stew overnight, and then he comes back to them and says, okay, I'm going to keep one of you. And so he has Simeon bound before their very eyes. The text says Joseph is the one doing the binding, so maybe he is, and he's very harsh with them. I don't know if he had a particular vendetta against Simeon. I don't know why he picked Simeon over the others, but that's what he did. Uh, later, when the brothers do come back, they bring Benjamin with them and and he comes up to benjamin and, and he says god be gracious to you my son i'll be right back and then he goes off and weeps because he has just seen his beloved full brother benjamin he's not wanting to do any harm to them especially to benjamin later in chapter well i guess it was earlier in chapter 43 when the brothers come over uh, they are in Joseph's house for a meal. That was not protocol. That was not typical. And so as a result, they are terrified. Why are we going to this guy's house? I mean, he was accusing us of being spies before. This does not sound good. And yet Joseph provides a, a wonderful meal to them. And he piles on the, the food that, that Benjamin gets to eat. He shows obvious favoritism toward Joseph, of course, they have no idea why, other than well, they really wanted him to come. Uh, Joseph, in, in typical Egyptian fashion, does not associate with these sheep uh, herders. He doesn't associate with them. He sits at his own table. Look at number nine. At the meal at Joseph's house, he seats his brothers from oldest to youngest. And they are astonished at this. They're talking amongst themselves, saying, what is going on? This is nuts. And the reason why is because, I mean, you look at some of these guys, they're just a year or two apart, some of them. Maybe even uh, some of the brothers are uh, very close to the same age. And yet, how were they determined from oldest to youngest? And the reason why is because Joseph knows his brothers. He knows who they are. He knows the order of their births because he's their brother. They have no idea. And then later, when the brothers go back for the second time, uh, he has put a, a cup, a silver cup, in Benjamin's sack. And we, we will read uh, some of that in chapter 44 in just a moment. Do you see how fun this story of Joseph is? There are so many details that are just delightful. And uh, if you didn't catch all those, of course, you can you can watch the uh, the repeat of, of the live stream, the recording. I, I want to point out three outbursts from Joseph. When he has to exit stage left, he does for the first two, but not for the third one. When, when we finally reach the climax of the Joseph story, he reveals his identity to his brothers. But the first time, was when he hears them discussing among themselves how they had sold Joseph to slavery, and, and they just know God is, is bringing all this, this bad um, accusations, all these accusations. It's because of what they did to their brother Joseph all those years ago. And, and, and then when he sees Benjamin for the first time, um, God be with you, my son. I got to go. I'll be right back. And he leaves and he, he weeps. And then finally, when he reveals his identity to his brothers. I mentioned last week that 
that Joseph is indeed the the main actor here. He's the he's the protagonist. He's the main actor. And if that's true, then Judah gets best supporting actor because Judah uh, comes out prominently in the Joseph story, really from Genesis 37 through 45. Uh, and uh, and we see J Judah taking a, a leadership role uh, here in the passage on the screen. He he is the one who stands up to Jacob. Nobody stood up to Jacob. He's he's the patriarch of the family, and uh, and yet Judah says we've got to go back a second time with Benjamin. Otherwise, we're going to starve to death. We have to go back, Dad. Uh, back in Genesis. 37, uh, when the story of Joseph begins, it was Judah who spoke up and said, let's not kill our brother. After all, he's our brother. Uh, let's sell him into slavery. <laughs> and of course, um, I don't think Judah was being pragmatic there, uh, being generous. Magnanimous is the word I should say. He wasn't trying to be nice to Joseph. He was trying to make some money off the sale. Of course, he had no idea how God's providence was going to play out in all of this. Isn't this fun? Well, then in chapter 38, we have this sordid story about Judah. And, and what we're seeing is that Judah is a scoundrel. He's a bad guy. He is not a good person. And, and in sharp contrast, uh, Joseph in the next chapter, in Genesis 39, uh, does not give in to sexual sin. Judah does. Uh, he... He, he has a sexual relationship with, with someone. Uh, and then Joseph, in the very next chapter, refuses to give in to sexual temptation. He even runs out of the room, leaving behind his coat. And then he's thrown into prison, uh, which, which just um, progresses the, the Joseph story. So Judah is taking a leadership role uh, and becoming a good person, we see. He, he's changed over this 20-year period. So when, when Jacob in chapter 43 says, no, uh, go back, but don't take Benjamin. You can't take Benjamin. If he, if he dies, something happens to him, I'm, de I'm dead. And Reuben, the firstborn, says to Jacob, well, well if, uh, if, if something happens to Benjamin, then you can kill my sons. What? Jacob doesn't want that either. These are his grandkids. It is Judah who says, send the boy with me uh, that we may live and not die. I will be surety for Benjamin. If anything happens to Benjamin, I will be held accountable for that. That's a whole lot better than what Reuben said. You can kill my sons. Judah saying, you can kill me in place of, uh, or because, because something bad has happened. Uh, we continue to see Judah uh, as he uh, comes to the forefront in, in chapter 44. We're going to read a lot of chapter 44 here in just a moment. But when, when Joseph uh, confronts the brothers and says, you, are, you have stolen from me, uh, your spies, uh, Judah speaks up and says, no, well, we are not. How can we prove this to you? How, how can we go about proving that, that we are not spies? And, and then in chapter 44, beginning of verse 18, Judah makes this impassioned speech that is so powerful as he pleads with this man he doesn't know is his brother Joseph, but he knows that their liberty is at stake. Their lives are at stake. And so Judah speaks up and says, oh, please, you, you can't kill us. Um, we are not spies. And if you're going to take the life of Benjamin, take my life instead. All right. And then after Joseph finally reveals his identity to his brothers, uh, he sends Judah ahead to get dad and bring him back, bring him back to Egypt, sp more specifically to the land of Goshen, where they're going to live for another 400 years. This is just a magnificent story. So 
Judah makes this impassioned speech beginning in Genesis um, 44, verse 18. And this is how it plays out. And so remember this when we, when we start reading. Joseph accuses the brothers. Uh, he says, I'm going to keep Benjamin, let you guys go back. Judah says, nope, we can't do that. Joseph speaks up again and says, yeah, I can. And then in verses 18 through 34, Judah has an uninterrupted speech where he pleads with Joseph. So let, let's let's go back through these chapters a little bit. I'm in I'm in Genesis 42, and um, and so Joseph is testing his brothers. In verse 14, he says, "It is as I said to you: you are spies. Uh, by this you shall be tested. By the life of Pharaoh, you shall not go from this place unless your younger brother comes here." So how are they going to go? not go back and how are they going to get Benjamin? And so finally he says, all right, this is what we're going to do. I'm going to test you for three days. And then on the third day, we'll see. So he binds Simeon in front of them. Um, and, uh, and he threatens them with death. Verse 21 of Genesis 42. Then they said to one another, in truth, we are guilty concerning our brother in that we saw the distress of his soul when he begged us, and we did not listen. That is why this distress has come upon us. Uh, there's Reuben uh, saying, did I not tell you to not sin against the boy? See, I told you, I told you, but you would not listen. This is why this distress has come upon us. So they're, they're just grumbling amongst each other. Uh, there's a reckoning for his blood, Reuben says, they did not know that Joseph understood them. That's Genesis 42, 23, for there was an interpreter between them. Then he turned away from them and wept. That's the first time he weeps. And he returned to them and spoke to them. He took Simeon from them and bound him before their eyes. Then he has their sacks filled with food but he puts their money back in the sacks. Do you remember that? He's toying with them. He puts their money back in their sacks. And so when they're traveling back from Egypt to Canaan, uh, one of them opens their sack and says, my money, look, my money is here. So they're taking some of the food so they can eat. And then all of the brothers, I guess there's nine of them at, uh, traveling back, all of them look in their sacks and sure enough, there's their money. And they were afraid. Verse 35, they are terrified. They go back and tell dad and, and he says, oh, you have bereaved me of my children. Joseph is no more. Simeon is no more. I mean, we might as well write Simeon off. And now you would take Benjamin? All oh, this has come against me. And that's when Reuben says, kill my two sons if I do not bring him back to you. And he says, no, 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 no. My son shall not go down with you. And so they wait and they wait and they wait until finally Judah says, we've got to go back with Benjamin. If you're going to send us back, dad, we've got to take Benjamin with us. Israel, uh, verse six, of course, this is Jacob. Israel said, why do you treat me so badly as to tell the man that you had another brother? And that's when they tell him, he kept asking us all these pointed questions. I mean, what were we supposed to do? We had no idea he was going to ask for our brother to come back. Isn't this, isn't this fun seeing how, how tortured they are as they're being tested by Joseph? So they go back and they take double the money. They take They take the money that they were supposed to have paid the first time. They take more money. They take gifts. They go back. And then they're told, oh, uh, you need to go to this man's house. They go to Joseph's house. There's all this delectable food set before them. And, uh, and, and Joseph seats them all in, in, in the place where, uh, uh, in order from oldest to youngest. I'm looking now at verse 27. Well, verse 26, when Joseph came home, they brought into the house to him the present that they had with them and bow down to him to the ground. So they're fulfilling the dreams all the more. He inquired about their welfare and said, is your father well? 
Uh, the old man of whom you spoke, is, is he still alive? <laughs> Your servant, our father, as well, he is still alive. And Joseph's going, Whew. oh, great, I'm so glad. And he says, oh, you brought your younger brother. Hey, uh, how, how you doing? Is this your youngest brother of whom you spoke to me? God be gracious to you, my son. Then Joseph hurried out, for his compassion grew warm for his brother. And he sought a place to weep. He entered his chamber and wept there. Then he washed his face and came out and controlling himself, he said, okay, supper time, let's eat. This is so much fun. And he sits by himself. The brothers are, are sitting from oldest to youngest, according to his youth. And the men looked at one another in amazement. Portions were taken them from Joseph's table, but Benjamin's portion was five times as much as any of theirs. And they drank and were merry with him. Maybe this... This guy is not so bad, but they're, they're still terrified of this Egyptian who hands out grain. They are terrified of him. Chapter 44. We're going to read all of chapter 44 now. When he commanded the steward of his house, fill, then he commanded the steward of the house, fill the men's sacks with food, with as much as they can carry. Put each man's money in the mouth of his sack and put my cup, the silver cup, in the mouth of the sack of the youngest with his money for the grain. And as he did, and he did as Joseph told him. Hmm. You, you know the train wreck that's about to happen. As soon as the morning was light, the men were sent away with their donkeys. They had only gone a short distance from the city. Now Joseph said to his steward, Hmm, okay. Up, follow after the men, and, and when you overtake them, say to them, why have you repaid evil for good? It's going to be so um, funny when I when you do that. <clears throat> Is it not from that my Lord drinks, and by this that he practices divination? You have done evil in doing this. Again, I don't believe Joseph practices divination. But he's got this silver cup in Benjamin's sack. And so he, that's what the, the servant of Joseph says. We haven't done this. No, we didn't do this. So they start looking in their sacks from the oldest to the youngest. Say, what, all right, well, let's take a look. And so there is this, this uh, slowing down of, of the action where each brother begins to open his sack. Verse 11, each man quickly lowered his sack to the ground and each opened his sack. He searched, beginning with the eldest, and ending with the youngest. So we, we can imagine you've got 10 brothers here uh, and you, you got the opening of, of sack number one, opening of sack number two, opening of sack number three, four, five, six, whew, no silver cup. See, we told you seven, eight, nine, no silver cup. And they're all on pins and needles. Oh no, please don't be in Benjamin's sack. Please don't be in Benjamin's sack. And there it was. They tore their clothes and every man loaded his donkey and they returned to the city. When Judah and his brothers, so Judah is singled out here. He's the leader now. When Judah and his brothers came to Joseph's house, he was still there. They fell before him to the ground. They keep bowing down to Joseph. Joseph said to them in his mean voice, <clears throat> What deed is this that you have done? Do you not know that a man like me can practice divination? And Judah said, so here we are in verse 16. Judah said, what, what shall we say to my Lord? What shall we speak? How can we clear ourselves? God has found out the guilt of your servants. Behold, we are your Lord's, my Lord's servants, your servants, both we and he also in whose hand the cup has been found. Joseph, verse 17. But he said, far be it from me that I should do so. Only the man in whose hand the cup was found shall be my servant. But as for you, go up in peace to your father. Everybody else can go. 
but I'm keeping Benjamin here. He's testing them. He wants to see what they do. And if, if the brothers say, okay, bye. Sorry, Benjamin. But if they don't, and so here we have this impassioned speech of Judah. Here we go. I'm going to read it in its entirety. Verses 18 through 34. Then Judah went up to him and said, O oh my Lord, your servant, speak a word in my Lord's ears. And let not your anger burn against your servant. For you were like Pharaoh himself. My Lord asked his servant, saying, Have you a father or a brother? And we said to my Lord, We have a father, an old man, and a younger brother, the child of his old age. His brother is dead, and he alone is left of his mother's children, and his father loves him. Then you said to your servants, Bring him down to me, that I may set my eyes on him. We said to my Lord, The boy cannot leave his father, for if he should leave his father, his father would die. Then you said to your servants, Unless your youngest brother comes down with you, you shall not see my face again. When we went back to your servant, my father, we told him the words of my Lord. And when our father said, Go again, buy us a little food, we said, We cannot go down. If our youngest brother goes with us, then we will go down. For we cannot see this man's face unless our youngest brother is with us. Then your servant, my father, said to us, You know that my wife bore two sons. This is still Judah talking here. One left me, and I said, Surely he has been torn to pieces. And I have never seen his, him since. Talking about Joseph. If you take this one also from me, and harm happens to him, you will bring down my gray hairs and evil to Sheol. I'll die if anything happens to Benjamin. Judah continues, now, therefore, as soon as I come to your servant, my father, and the boy is not with us, then as his life is bound up in the boy's life, as soon as he sees that the boy is not with us and your servants, uh, he will die. And your servants will bring down the gray hairs of your servant, our father, with sorrow to Sheol. For your servant became a pledge, talking about himself now. I became a pledge of safety for the boy to my father, saying, If I do not bring him back to you, then I shall bear the blame before my father all my life. Now, therefore, please let your servant remain instead of the boy. Let me remain in place of Benjamin as a servant to my Lord. And let the boy go back with his brother. For how can I go back to my father if the boy is not with me? I fear to see the evil that would find my father. Then Joseph could not control himself before all those who stood by him. He cried, make everyone go out from us. So no one stayed with him when Joseph made himself known to his brother. He wept aloud so that the Egyptians heard it and the household of Pharaoh heard it. And Joseph said to his brothers, I am Joseph. Is my father still alive? But his brothers could not answer him for they were dismayed at his presence. They're, they're, they're in shock here. They, they are terrified. <laughs> they are in disbelief. Verse 4, so Joseph said to his brothers, come near to me, please. And they came near. And he said, I am your brother Joseph, whom you sold into Egypt. And now do not be distressed or angry with yourselves because you sold me here. For God sent me before you to preserve life. And so we have come to the climax of the Joseph story. And Joseph has learned that this was all part of God's plan. When he saw his brothers come back, bow down to him, fulfilling his dreams, Joseph was able to put two and two together. All right, we are not going to look at uh, chapters 46 through 50. 
uh, except the very end of, of chapter 50. And so if you have a Bible, you're reading along, uh, take a look at chapter 50. Um, but uh, what, what I want to point out is that uh, Jacob travels to Egypt and the family lives in Goshen and they survive the famine. Uh, Jacob talks to his sons. He talks to Joseph and says, look, I want you to take my bones back to Canaan because there's a cave there. You remember uh, all the people who were in that cave, Abraham and Sarah, Isaac and, and Rebecca, Leah, and now Jacob will be the final person to be buried in that cave. Uh, these are the progenitors of, of the Abrahamic line. Abraham and Sarah have Isaac. Isaac and Rebecca have Jacob. Jacob and Rachel have, among others, Judah, through whom the, the promise uh, continues. Now, Joseph is in very important, obviously. Uh, but what, what Jacob demands is that they take his bones, uh, his, his sarcophagus, to Canaan. I myself will go down with you to Egypt, and I will bring you up again. Do you know who's talking there? That's God. God is speaking to Jacob, just like he did at Bethel back in chapter 28. I will bring you back to this land when, when Jacob is about to go to Paden Aram, and he says, I'm going to bring you back to Canaan. And now he's saying, you're in Egypt, and I'm going to bring you back to Canaan. This is so important. I want to close by bringing out who the real protagonist is of all of Genesis. It's God. Who told Noah to build an ark? God did. Who told Abraham to leave Ur of the Chaldeans? God did. Who arranged Isaac to marry Rebecca? Remember the, the servant who, who prayed to God to reveal uh, Rachel? And it was God who did that, who made it all happen that way. Jacob grew wealthy in livestock and in children. Why? Because God blessed him. Joseph rose to power, all because of God. And Joseph was able to look at his life and see how God worked through his providence to make it happen. Now, Joseph did well by being faithful to God, he didn't practice divination, and, uh, and God rewarded him. So I'm not going to spend a lot of time on these verses. I just want to overwhelm you with all these verses that talk about the Lord providing for the patriarchs, the fathers of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And, and so the Lord is the one who says, go from your country and to a land I will show you. And the Hebrew writer gives us divine commentary. Abraham was looking forward to the city that has foundations, whose builder and maker is God. God says, I will bless those who bless you. I will curse those who dishonor you. And what do we see later in that chapter when, when Abraham is in Egypt and uh, he passes his wife off as his sister and the Pharaoh there uh, pulls her into his harem, uh, doesn't touch her, but thinks, hey, I'm going I'm to take this beautiful woman to be my, my wife along with all the, uh, his other wives. The Lord afflicted. Who did? The Lord afflicted Pharaoh with great plagues. Of course, this anticipates what we'll be looking at next week, the Exodus and the plagues against Egypt and the Pharaoh. God came to Abimelech uh, later when, when Abraham passed his wife off as his sister again while living in the land of the Philistines. God came to Abimelech and said, oh, you're a dead man. And, and God protected Abraham. Uh, the Lord had blessed Abraham uh, the text says in chapter 24. Uh, and so um, it's obvious that God is behind everything going on. Uh, when, when, uh, when Sarah had a child, the Lord is the one who visited her. The Lord did to Sarah as he had promised. That's, that's not uh, what Genesis 25, 19 says. I think I have the wrong citation there. Uh-oh, 25, 19. Yeah, sorry about that. That would be from chapter uh, eight, uh, chapter twenty. Um, I have the wrong citation. Uh, same thing there as well. But the Lord is the one who was answering the prayers of Isaac uh, when 
when Rebecca went to inquire of the Lord uh, about the, the fighting of the children. It's the Lord who reveals to him, uh, reveals to Rebecca, the older shall serve the younger. That's the wrong citation. I am so sorry. This is correct, though. Do not go down to Egypt, the Lord says to Isaac. Stay here, and I'm going to protect you. I'm going to take care of you. Every step of the way, the Lord. It was plain to everybody. It was a plain to um, Abimelech, uh, the king of the Philistines. He says, the Lord has been with you. It's obvious that he has been. Jacob even acknowledges this. If God will be with me, I will keep. he will keep me in the way that I go. He knows that God is the one who is providing him children. Leah, uh, the Lord opened Leah's womb. He kept Rachel from having children, interestingly. And, and over and over again, it's the Lord who is blessing Jacob. Laban is the one who acknowledges this. Um, God has taken away the livestock of your father, Jacob says to his wives, and given them to me. Uh, if God had not been on my side, Jacob says. So he, he acknowledges God is the one helping him. God answers me. God has been with me wherever I have gone. And then Joseph. Joseph has success as a slave because the Lord was with Joseph. We see that twice in Genesis 39. Uh, Joseph, when he's asked to give the interpretation of the dreams, says, do not interpretations belong to God. In chapter 45, God answers me in the day of my distress and has been with me wherever I have gone. And then finally, we're going to end here. When Joseph, um, when, when Jacob has died and now the brothers are afraid, oh, he's finally going to kill us. He didn't kill us while dad was alive. Joseph says to them, I'm not going to kill you. I'm not. Dad's dead, but I forgive you. And he says this. Genesis 50, verse 20, so important. As for you, you meant evil against me. You, you, you wanted to kill me. You sold me into slavery. You meant evil against me. But God meant it for good to bring about what uh, that many people should be kept alive as they are today. And then J Joseph made this command to his brothers when he was about to die. And he says to, 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 to the family, I should say, he says, take my bones back with you when you leave Egypt and go to Canaan, because he has such confidence in God and his promises. Thank you for studying the wonderful story of Joseph. I'd like to encourage you to read Genesis 37 through 50. Uh, if you just read chapter 37 through 45, uh, that'll be that'll be great and and have all these details all these delightful events that transpire in the back of your mind as you read and look for them and be amazed at god's providence in the life of joseph next week we will be leaving genesis and going into exodus and seeing how god unleashed the ten plagues against egypt thanks so much for watching I really appreciate all who have tuned in. Hope you enjoy reading and studying the story of Joseph. Thank you so much.